Okay. Uh, friends, I think we'll uh, get uh, started. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, uh, first of all, uh, let me begin by thanking the Ministry of Environment, Forests and Climate Change of the Government of India for the opportunity to uh, present some of this work that we would be talking about at this pavilion event. Uh, uh, it, of course, is uh, our work, uh, uh, you know, inspired, of course, very much by the general context of India's uh, uh, mitigation policy, not only India, of course, the larger question of uh, the developing world and uh, how mitigation relates to development. So I think uh, uh, we are very grateful for this uh, uh, you know, gesture on the part of the government of India. Uh, we also were expecting our, uh, the secretary of the ministry, but madam is held up by other engagements. Uh, the negotiations are very packed and tight. So uh, we, of course, uh, <coughs> appreciate her uh, compulsions. Uh, we have with us, uh, apart from the presenters, one of whom will be myself, this is a self-organized event, if you wish. Uh, then uh, my colleague, Dr. Tejal Kanetkar, will uh, make the second half of the presentation. And uh, we are very grateful to uh, three distinguished panelists uh, who have uh, consented to comment. Uh, uh, perhaps they could uh, rise for the occasion. Not all may know you. One is uh, Dr. Yuba Sokona, uh, Vice Chair of Working Group 3 of the IPCC. <laughs> Dr. Uh, Anand Patwardhan, a well-known expert on adaptation from the University of Maryland. And uh, the third is uh, Mr. Diego Pacheco of the head of delegation of Bolivia. Uh, we were hopeful uh, he would be joining us. We are still hopeful. So we look forward to uh, his uh, coming here. So without further uh, ado, let me start. Uh, perhaps the discussants may not take their uh, seats on the uh, podium immediately because uh, it would be difficult to see the presentation, but subsequently I would invite them. So uh, I hope I am not challenged by this. Okay, so let me, which this, and now that's even worse. Can, can't I, oh, it won't move on this. Can you just, uh, okay. Got it. Thank you. So uh, this is a, a work which, uh, which is in progress, but it has reached a certain stage where we felt that making the results uh, public would be appropriate. Uh, we have a published preprint on this. Perhaps at the end, uh, we uh, will be able to give you the link to the uh, preprint version. We also have a policy brief which lays out uh, more clearly what we think are the policy implications and it is light on the uh, technical details. But the technical details are all available in the paper. So since, uh, let me give uh, what is the bottom line that we have that our message for today. Our statement is that the IPCC uh, AR6 working group three scenarios project a highly unequal future world that perpetuates most current inequalities. This is the first headline statement. The second headline statement are that growth and development are restricted for developing countries in these scenarios. 
these scenarios do not take uh, uh, well it is not just fossil fuel consumption which is restricted but it is uh, growth and development itself which is restricted the uh, it follows from this that uh, we elaborate of course that these scenarios do not take account of equity and uh, cbdr and rc common but differentiated responsibilities and respective capabilities our conclusion from this for policy is that developing countries in particular but and i would advise developed countries should also take these outcomes seriously as we live in a common world a single world that these summary assessments and illustrative mitigation pathways must not be used as benchmarks if they are not in line with the convention this raises other issues i'm sure we'll have opportunity to discuss them and we would explain ourselves further so why is this equity assessment of the global mitigation pathways of the ar6 necessary the short answer is because it was not done in the ipcc working group 3 report uh we do of course note that the uh, uh the ipcc uh, report makes this very clear it says clearly that most scenarios do not make explicit assumption about global equity environmental justice or intra regional income distribution it also notes that global emission pathways including those based on cost effective approaches contain regionally differentiated assumptions and outcomes and have to be assessed with a careful recognition of these assumptions regional here in the sense of modeling is the point to note and the regional here is not a purely geographical thing because there are some models perhaps which may do that but there is certainly a separation of regions that are more or less fully developed the majority of nations in them and regions where the majority of nations are not developed but the equity and cbdrrc are central to the convention and its kp and pa and so this is a matter of much interest when it comes to applying scenarios to negotiations so we begin with the elementary fact known of course to all the experts but bears repetition every time that there is wide global disparity in uh, historical emissions the annex 1 countries uh, constitute about 19% of the global population uh, their historical cumulative emissions up to 2019 are 68% uh, percent. and of course the non annex 1 countries uh, constitute 81% percent of the global population and their contribution to historical cumulative emissions is 32% percent. this is not simply an abstract statement of number but it, behind this is the entire story of development especially post 1850s because of the intrinsic relationship of fossil fuels to development that we have had so far so the uh, overwhelming domination uh, of uh, annex 1 we have already the graphics as said it no need to elaborate we can work out the country wise uh, cumulative emissions so this illustrates that uh, all developing countries including those which are labeled as high emitters in the media the second largest emitter the third largest emitter the first highest emitter all of them have drawn less than their fair share of the carbon budget india and southern asia happens to be particularly low in this regard whereas all the other countries of the annex 1 have vastly overshot uh in a sense we can discuss later if you want in a very precise sense what we would consider a fair share of the global carbon budget so far so uh we can go into more details how it varied between 
1850 and 1990 and 1991 to 2018 because the benchmark is the uh, signing of the convention. So uh, we could think of it in monetary terms and at the negotiations, this is an idea that has been around. Uh, we think it is important that it be kept in play, it be revived, that the carbon debt and credit forms the fundamental benchmark of uh, financial support. And if you monetize technology transfer and uh, uh, capacity building. Contested it may be, but I think the idea has been with the developing countries consistently for, uh, three, for the three decades since they signed the convention. So uh, one uh, point about the clarification that the carbon budget perspective provides, uh, and to this audience perhaps I need not reiterate, but I will do it again, that we consider equity to be founded on the principle of the equitable and fair sharing of the global carbon budget, both the past and the future. And if by this criterion we consider that nations should stay within their fair share, then the net zero target dates that we have for different countries are uh, vastly uh, still uh, allow a much greater appropriation of the budget. So the point about inequity that we must underline is the fact that it is uh, recognized and acknowledged, but the question is, is it operationalized? So the IPCC AR6, to be fair to the authors and the leadership, uh, does contain several calls to climate justice, equitable climate action, and just transitions. The words are splattered all over, but little attention, especially in quantitative terms, is uh, available. Regretfully, our conclusion from our work is that if we open the hood and look under, then the situation seems to be even more uh, serious. So uh, this is, again, uh, I uh, point this to say that it is not, of course, from the Working Group 3 report. There is some information that we can draw. But since the scenarios have uh, something of, what shall we say? On the one hand, they seem to suggest a descriptive account of the future. But our concern with scenarios very clearly, and this is briefly noted in passing in the report itself, is are scenarios performative? Are they describing the world that you want to see happen? And are you persuading people by saying the world will be such and such to say indeed, indeed to create a world that will follow this trajectory? This is what I think the performative character that makes it particularly difficult uh, for us in dealing with these questions. So the scenarios, do they describe a statistical distribution? Uh, regretfully, the uh, answer is they are not. They are not a sample. There is a call, an invitation to people to present. And those who can get their act together, so to speak, can come and present. And this is the source of the, uh, we feel that in the first instance, the statistical language, distributional language used in the description of its results are problematic on this score. So I am not going to spend time further in the description of the uh, details of the various scenarios, how much were accepted. Uh, the vetting criteria for scenarios is already something of concern. So we need to uh, have a rethink on that, but we will be presenting uh, uh, analysis of a subset. It is not a, uh, shall we say, it is by no means a complete subset, but it represents a very important section of the scenarios that make up the uh, conclusions of the, and the findings of the IPCC AR6. So, 
so there are different classes of scenarios. We will not be analyzing the whole range from C1 to C8 to use the jargon of the report. The, uh, our work is focused on only those which deal with 1.5 and 2 degrees centigrade. They come from one uh, particular model in intercomparison project. Our work is being extended to cover all other uh, scenarios as well. And uh, uh, at this point, I will hand over to my colleague uh, Tejal Kanetkar for the rest of the analysis. Thank you. Thank you, Chairman. Let me quickly go over uh, some of the results. I hope all of you have the policy brief. Some of these uh, results are summarized here. These are the variables that we focus on. Uh, GDP is one. It is in PPP terms. Um, uh, then consumption. Uh, this is reported as consumption in the scenario database. Uh, this is, of course, in the uh, integrated assessment models. Uh, language, it is basically the consumption of uh, goods and services. Uh, we uh, also look at primary energy use, fossil fuel use, uh, CO2 sequestration uh, across the scenarios, emissions uh, and different metrics of emissions and net zero years uh, that the scenarios uh, project. Uh, and of course, then uh, at the end, the model shared versus the fair share of the carbon budget. Um, this is the first variable. This is GDP per capita. Uh, the first uh, number that you see on the left uh, are the numbers for 2020. Uh, the numbers on the right are for 2050. This is for the 10 region classification. Uh, the arrows in blue are broadly for the annex, uh, non-annex one regions. The arrows in red uh, show the broadly the annex one regions. Uh, you already have extremely high levels of per capita GDP in the annex one regions. And these are projected to go even further. Um, a lot of the, if you look at sub-Saharan Africa, the GDP in 2050, that's 30 years from now, remains at levels of nine, uh, 9,000 uh, per person. In South Asia, this remains at 17,000 per person. Uh, if you look at various, uh, the, uh, there is literature from many years that correlates uh, uh, GDP, which is often used as a proxy for income. Uh, with levels of development, and if you look at, at what levels, a lot of these variables, uh, like life expectancy, mean years of schooling, etc., correlate non-linearly with GDP. If you look at what, at what level this uh, uh, sort of stabilizes, these levels are somewhere around 30,000. 30, so beyond 30,000, 35,000 perhaps, maybe a little more for some regions, uh, the gains that you get from increased incomes in terms of human development stabilize. Uh, but a lot of the developing regions don't even reach those levels across the scenarios in 2050. If you look at consumption, the numbers are even more stuck. Um, uh, Sub-Saharan Africa, South Asia go from one to two. Uh, you have uh, North America, et cetera, Pacific OECD, the Annex One regions going um, up further up. Uh, one can argue, of course, that uh, going from one to two, 1,000 to 2,000 is doubling of uh, uh, consumption in the non-annex one regions, whereas going from 38 to 45 is not doubling. So therefore, there is a higher growth rate that is projected for the uh, annex one regions. But I'm sure that everybody in this room will agree that that's hardly the measure for equity that we, are, uh, uh, we aspire to, uh, doubling from 1,000 to 1,000, uh, even if it is a higher growth rate as compared to uh, 38 thousand to 45 thousand is uh, not something that uh, we you know people across those regions are likely to be happy about this is true across scenarios uh, these are numbers for c3 scenarios which are two degrees celsius with 67 percent probability so it's not just the numbers that were shown earlier were for c1 category scenarios so this is true also for c3 scenarios uh, that's gdp and consumption so uh, I have already made this point. Uh, the levels are projected to be extremely low, much lower than even the current levels of GDP in developed countries overall, and much, much lower than the current levels of GDP in the OECD countries, which are, in fact, projected to grow even further. Uh, we then have, of course, the energy uh, consumption in 2050. Uh, sorry. 
So these are um, the red bars again. There's some problem, yeah. There's some lag here. Uh, the red bars show the uh, energy consumption per capita for Annex 1 regions. The blue bars show across C1 to C4 categories the energy consumption for non-Annex 1 regions. Um, and what you see here, of course, the last two bars are again for South Asia and Sub-Saharan Africa, the per capita energy, and this is a weighted average across models. So we uh, take scenarios, uh, we bin scenarios across, uh, we have uh, brief methodological notes in the, uh, in the brief that we have uh, circulated, uh, and we look at weighted averages within each scenario category. And so we have extremely low levels of energy per ca consumption uh, even in 2050. Is it possible to achieve levels of well-being, uh, universal well-being for our populations, infrastructure, schools, hospitals, roads, um, um, human development uh, with 20 to 30 gigajoules of energy in 2050? So that's, it's going to be much lower uh, going up to 2050, but reaching uh, 30 in 2050. Do we have evidence from any part of the world that this has been possible with 30 gigajoules of energy consumption? Um, that these remain key questions. Um, if you look at uh, what happens, the, the trajectories from 2020 and 2050 across, uh, except for Europe, across the Annex 1 regions, energy consumption is projected to, in fact, grow. Across the uh, non-Annex 1 regions, uh, it, in fact, reduces from already very low levels. Uh, uh, just a minor increase uh, for, uh, for China plus, uh, it remains more or less constant, but a minor increase for Sub-Saharan Africa from already very low levels. The pattern is the same for C3 scenarios as well. Um, and this is, um, uh, a lot of the increased energy consumption is also facilitated by continued levels of higher per capita fossil fuel consumption in the developed countries. So if you look at C1 and C2 scenarios there, these are 1.5 degree scenarios. Per capita fossil fuel consumption in Annex 1 regions, those are the red graphs uh, uh, the, the front, uh, continue to remain much higher um, as compared to a lot of the other, uh, the non-Annex 1 regions. Uh, this is true across scenarios. If you look fuel-wise, uh, then of course, a large majority of the fossil fuel use is oil and gas in North America, but coal continues to remain a source of energy across even the C1 scenarios. These are scenarios with no or limited overshoot to a 1.5 degrees Celsius. So even C1 scenarios, you have uh, coal use that continues to 2050 in the North American regions. Uh, region. So does, and it is in fact true also of the Pacific OECD, uh, of the European Union. Um, the Middle East, of course, is uh, uh, continues to provide uh, the oil and gas uh, for uh, the Annex 1 regions. And uh, you, if you look at uh, South Asia and Sub-Saharan Africa, uh, not just the oil and gas use, but coal use also is lower. Coal use uh, is lower as compared to the Annex 1 regions across these countries. <coughs> the share of fossil fuel use as compared to 2019 increases for the Annex 1 regions. So the total fossil fuel use does go down. Uh, in C1 scenarios, of course, otherwise you cannot have a reduction in emissions. But the share or the global, if you look at the global share of fossil fuel use, it's about 30% in Annex 1 countries for 19% of the population currently. It will go up in the C1 scenarios to 36% by 2050. Uh, it goes down for the other regions. Uh, this is true also of the C4 scenarios, which is 2 degrees Celsius with only 50% probability. So you have a higher share of fossil fuel use in the Annex 1 regions, uh, even in the 2 degrees Celsius scenarios. So a high, uh, the 2 degrees Celsius scenarios afford a higher carbon budget, so perhaps a little more flexibility for the developing countries to uh, catch up, to develop. And what happens really across the scenarios is that the increased carbon budget is uh, allocated to the developed countries. Um, this is, of course, facilitated by assumptions and projections of much higher sequestration uh, till 2050 in the developing countries. If you look at uh, the first, uh, this is C1 scenarios, the red graphs are land use 
uh, sequestration from land use in Annex 1 and sequestration from CCS in Annex 1. These are not uh, all negative emissions. Some of these are, of course, will be negative emissions, but this also includes sequestration from industry and fossil fuel use. So it will be, um, so, but a large number, amount of it is really from the uh, non-Annex 1 regions. This is true across scenarios again, except for C3, where there is a little bit more uh, sequestration from uh, CCS in the Annex 1 countries as compared to land use in Annex 1 countries. Um, so across models, this, this is not a per capita measure. So because the regional classifications are different across different models, when we, uh, and we, use, when we provide per capita numbers, it's possible to normalize these. But uh, when we are providing absolute numbers, we have to provide model-wise results. And model-wise, uh, if you look at C1 categories, for example, across models, a large majority of the sequestration up to 2050 happens in developing countries. So higher fossil fuel use continues in developed countries to 2050. Higher sequestration uh, facilitates this in developing countries till 2050. This is true, again, for C3 scenarios as well. And uh, uh, this, of course, translates to a very different results for CO2. All regions reduce CO2 emissions, so do the uh, Annex 1 regions. Um, but regions of the global south, Latin America, for example, in uh, scenario categories C1 and C2, reach net zero much before uh, regions of the global north. Uh, so they're, in fact, across scenarios, uh, Latin America reaches net zero. Um, you know, before 2050, around even before 2045, and some scenarios even before 2040. Right. Uh, so this is shown here. I'm sorry. I'm just going to. I know I'm running out of time. So Latin America is right there. The third bar. It has much earlier net zero years. The bar shows the range of net zero years across models. So uh, they are different. So Latin America, for example, across model scenarios. Uh, across models for the C1 category is projected to reach net zero uh, much before North America across uh, all models. Um, so what happens if you look at near-term emissions? Even in terms of near-term emissions for the C1 category scenarios, um, developing countries are projected to reduce emissions at a much, much faster level. So if you look at uh, um, developing countries and the rates of emissions reductions uh, projected between 2020 and 2030 for developing, these are some developing countries here, uh, it's 8.3% reduction in sub-Saharan Africa uh, versus 5.2% reduction in North America. Uh, South Asia also is 53 um, and Latin America is 7.3. So not only do all regions start emissions reductions immediately, but non-Annex 1 regions, in fact, reduce faster. As com uh, you know, and this, is in, uh, this completely is inverted to the principle of equity and CBDRRC. It's not, even, it's not simply not considering equity, but it's, in fact, inverting the principles of equity and C CBDRRC. This, uh, these are uh, peaking years. Uh, C1 scenarios, it's 2020. There is a progressive increase across scenarios, but... Uh, uh, more or less in this decade across regions, um, emissions are supposed to peak. And of course, uh, we have already seen this number in Jaraman's uh, presentation. You have 19% uh, and 81%. The numbers differ slightly from the 57% uh, that he showed for the IPCC because it, uh, it is, uh, uh, that number doesn't include uh, the reforming economies. So this number includes reforming economies. It's Annex 1 as a whole, 68%. Uh, uh, if you look at the projected contribution to total CO2 emissions from C1 scenario, so this is what C1, so once we reach global net zero, uh, Annex 1 regions will still have, a, uh, have consumed 57% of the total carbon budget uh, for 19% of the population. This is the rest of the world, which is 81% of the population, will have to contend with uh, a much smaller uh, amount. And this is for C3 scenarios the situation doesn't change much. So uh, this is by regions. Uh, this is uh, simply if you look at South Asia there, because it's easiest, easiest to see. And uh, Sub-Saharan Africa, 24% and 13% are the fair shares. You have 4% uh, and 4% as historical, and 7% for South Asia as the, in the total carbon budget. Um, 
this is just uh, some of these numbers. We can talk about them later. I know I'm out of time, so let me just conclude by saying that, um, uh, reiterating what Jairaman has said, that the projected future in 2050 is an unequal world that perpetuates or aggravates inequalities of today. Um, these are pervasive and uh, uh, apply to all variables, macroeconomic variables, fossil fuel consumption, as well as emissions-related uh, variables. These inequalities are projected in, into the future by restraining any transformative growth in a majority of the developing countries, including in India uh, and South Asia. This is important for us. Uh, we are at the India Pavilion. I think it's uh, necessary to underline this. Um, so let me um, conclude. I've already said this uh, by saying that modeling, modeling and scenario building ex exercises, if we don't correct them now, if these are essentially imaginations of a future. Do we want the, a future that is unequal? Do we want a future that perpetuates current inequalities? Or do we want a planet that is livable? I mean, this is the IPCC language, that the pl planet has to be livable. But does it, should it not be livable for all those who live on this planet? It can it only be livable for a certain section that lives in the global north? Uh, so I leave you with that thought uh, and some of these points, which you can, of course, read off. Thank you very much. So uh, thank you very much, uh, Tejal. Uh, may I now invite the discussants uh, to the podium. Uh, I must recognize, I must apologize that Professor Jim Skia, co-chair of uh, IPCC Working Group 3 here. Uh, hey, uh, Jim, please, hey, join us on the podium. Uh, so I think we'll uh, uh, stay with the order that we had uh, uh, advertised in the uh, uh, poster for the event. So ah, before I continue, uh, very briefly, uh, 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 enormous amount of work for this uh, work was done by our student, Akhil Maitri. He is uh, not here, but he is watching us on uh, the webcast. So I think a round of applause is due to uh, our co-author uh, on this. Uh, and he is not going to become an IPCC author, right? <laughs> <laughs> so uh, now I uh, request uh, uh, Yuba Sokona, a good friend, for his uh, remarks uh, on what we have just presented. You are. Okay. Thank you. Thank you for inviting me to uh, take part to this uh, conversation. Uh, as when accepted, I indicated clearly that I'm not representing IPCC. This has to be clear. Now, having said that, I'm here as Yuba Sukona, not as IPCC. That has to be clear. I, th I think that. You, you bring some, one of the most important elements on the climate debate and focusing on that, on the equity aspect. If you look at the, the scientific part of the first assessment report, the second assessment report, equity was not there. It started to get in with the third assessment report. And at that time, some of us have raised a number of issues. And even the development was not part of the IPCC uh, assessment. And then we get nervous. I remember one of the first IPCC meetings I participated in the uh, early 90s. I said, Why, what I'm doing here? They are talking about economics and the climate science. I'm interested in development, not those different issues. And then things have uh, changed. And then the, the, to bringing that element, perpetuating, is an important element. And 
I think also uh, one of uh, the key aspects uh, you try to uh, cover is also very important and all the element of what future we want to have at globally. I think there is a need to make a disconnect between two aspects. And that was not clear uh, going through your presentation report. IPCC and the scenarios and the modeling because IPCC is not a research institution, it's not making any research, it's not doing any modeling, it's assessing literature. And then the fact is that it's assessing the existing, I remember back to the, when some of us, we said that we don't want at all to be involved in it because the issues that we are interested in it is not there. They said that you need to make a publication on those different issues to get them in. And this is important. And I think there's inherently problem with integrated assessment modeling at the global level. And this is different from IPCC. And then we all have to recognize that I am one of the first one who clearly indicated that I do not see my future and my present in integrated assessment modeling. Just not IPCC had nothing to do with IPCC. And we had a lot of debate in it with the, the model because it's, it's, it's uh, because modeling is based on assumptions. And you, you bring a number of assumptions and you build your assumption based on that. And then we are in a village. And then the planet is a village. At the same time, it's diverse. There's a huge diversity in the village. And then hardly those kind of model can capture the diversity of uh, the, the, in which we are. And this is one of the problems. Recently, on 4th of, uh, you present the Sub-Saharan Africa. It looked like it's a village. On the 24th of October, we published a paper in Nature Energy that indicating clearly Africa needs context-relevant evidence to shape its, its, uh, its clean energy future. Because there is no single future for Africa, for Africa as a continent. Because there is a huge diversity in the continent and the pathway are completely different. I can take two extremes and then this is relevant also for any de for developing country, for any situation in which we are. And I thought we need to capture those different elements. Do we have a relevant tool and then to capture those different aspects in order to address some fundamental element that is a, reduce, a reduction of inequality, the equity consideration, and the livable future for all of us. And then those are some of the fundamental. It's possible, but the different pathway will lead to that. And then those are some of the fundamental questions we need to bring. And then to, to, to make it short, we came up for many people who are not African, they think that is a single village. And this, this is the thing that needs to be done. And when we analyze, we come up with the, the situation where, where the energy, the, the electricity uh, consumption rate, the access to electricity is high, they have low level as cost of renewables, particularly the solar. And then where it's not, it's very high. And then we came up finally, and then to look at the continent, it can be uh, three different clusters. And then you indicate uh, to, to, uh, uh, four different clusters. I will take the two extremes. The first extreme is South Africa. It's a clear, defined energy system in place based on fossil fuel with a key role of coal. And the other extreme is like my country in Mali, with limited access to energy, very low, landlocked, and uh, not all producing country. And then in between, you have a country like uh, Ethiopia or like Kenya, they can go faster in uh, uh, low carbon, zero carbon, because of the basis they do have that in their uh, Ethiopia and um, hydro, and then in Kenya, geothermal and other. 
and you have some other country, those are in a kind of dilemma. And then if you look at the future, it's a, a bit a problem. All the countries in Africa where they are discovering gas, natural gas, actually, what they will do with it. And then you project that how can we project the, the, the GDP of those country by 2050? And then we do not know where the world will go in. Are they be able to invest in natural gas for the development? Or if they invest on it, it will be a standard asset, and then so that they will face a number of other problems. And I think that those realities, those specificities, if we rely on certain type of modeling, is very difficult. But there is a way of getting around. OK. Those are some of the elements I just want to bring to your attention. It's a very important issue. It's uh, uh, important, but we need and then to bring the element of the contextualization of all those elements is very important. This is relevant for Africa. Is this case, case also for Asia as well as for Europe. Thank you. Now, uh, Dr. Anand Patwadla. Yeah, thanks, uh, thanks, Dayaman and Tejal. Really interesting uh, results, and uh, I'm happy you you put this brief together. But in a way, these results uh, I think are also they're interesting, but also quite predictable because what they reflect is sort of a simple mathematical reality that so much of the historical carbon budget has been used up that once you take the linear relationship between temperature and cumulative carbon then mathematically, something has to give. And what has to give is essentially you have no carbon space left for the developing world. So you're going to have to have uh, constrained uh, growth and constrained consumption. So in a way, it sort of sets that up uh, quite directly. But moving then to the question of scenarios, I think I'm also very happy that, Jaraman, you brought up this notion of performative character of scenarios. Because I think we really need to understand what scenarios are and what they are not, right? So in my mind, there's kind of two dimensions on which you can look at scenarios. You can look at scenarios as either normative or positive, right? So normative scenarios will be about how the world should be. Positive scenarios are about the how the world might be. And they're quite different. Uh, I suspect that many of what, much of what we have seen are really positive scenarios. And, and so positive scenarios are obviously going to have a high element of inertia and grandfathering built into them because they're starting with where you are now. And where you might be obviously is, cons you know, in a sense determined by where you are today. You also have scenarios that uh, you can look at on another dimension, which is that are forward-looking or that are backcasting. So forward-looking scenarios are what-if scenarios, what if certain happens. Uh, Backcasting scenarios are how-to scenarios. They'll start from a uh, desirable end state and work backwards of how you get there. Unfortunately, I think the way scenarios have been traditionally used in the IPCC, and this is not just the AR6, but I'm thinking of all the way going back to the SRES and going back to earlier assessment cycles, most of the IPCC scenario work has been concentrated in a particular quadrant of this space, right? So these are what-if scenarios, they are positive scenarios, and they are forward-looking scenarios. Because they have, their purpose has been to inform modeling. Their purpose has been to inform and provide the inputs to being able to do modeling. And models, that's the nature of models. They're trying to make a projection of a future world starting from a set of initial conditions uh, with a set of uh, assumptions that provide you consistent parameter values through which you can run models. So if that is your purpose, then obviously you're going to really explore one quadrant of that space. You're not really going to look at fundamental questions, normative questions, or what should the world look like, and where obviously in that question, when you pose that question, then equity and justice will become central to it. Because I don't think anyone will disagree that we want a world that is low carbon, but we also want a world that is fair and just and equitable. Now, the problem is very often, uh, you know, in, 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 in optimization, we might call this as an over-constrained problem. 
and you might find that there is no feasible solution. But then that, is, that has to come out very clearly, that where are the trade-offs? But some of these trade-offs are hidden because models are being used uh, simply in a way, scenarios are being used to construct modeled futures that are not reflecting some of explicitly, making explicit some of these value judgments about what the world should be like, uh, but rather they are, or, uh, in a sense, constraining the world by where it is today and therefore by where it will be in the future. And then my final point I wanted to make is really sort of if, if that is where so far we have used scenarios sort of in the, in, the, in the modeling sense, unfortunately we tend to think of models as truth machines. And they are not, right? So uh, we have simply have uh, started to think that just because we have a modeled future it has to be true in some way. And this goes back to, Jaram, and your point about the statistical. Uh, if you think of it that way, then of course you can try and produce a statistical distribution. But they're not that, right? They are really meant, in a sense, to build understanding, not as, as, uh, building, uh, as, as projecting some kind of a truth. And I think the best place to see this, where this comes out really clearly, is in this concept of overshoot scenarios. Right. So these overshoot scenarios present, in my view, and what you showed were some undesirable futures, right? Futures which are not equitable where uh, development is constrained. But in my view, overshoot scenarios also present an infeasible world because they are essentially a modeling artifice that generates enormous amounts of negative emissions to meet a budget constraint without really capturing the fact that these are simply not feasible to produce at the scale at which models are demanding them. And so in some ways now you have this peculiar problem where you have scenarios, you're using them to, gener uh, to inform and drive models, and now you think that the output of these models is actually a reasonable model future. And I think the conclusion I draw is that these are neither desirable nor feasible futures in most cases. So let me kind of stop here and hand back to you. Thank you, Anand. Yeah. Uh, now, uh, Jim. Yeah, yeah, certainly. And just to say, there was quite a lot I agreed with, with the sentiment in the presentations, uh, actually. So I'm definitely not going to take revenge for the Working Group 3 approval. Rest, <laughs> rest, uh, rest, 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 rest safely, safely uh, you, you, you know, with, with that. And just to say, I think as the, the, sort of the people in the leadership of IPCC, we have eight months to go before the end of our term. Uh, you and I are probably old men in a hurry, so we will start to say what we, we really think at this, the, this stage of the process so just a, a, a few things to you know, to, to observe there and where I'm going to try to get to is that if you want to press the case on equity I'm actually going to give try to give you some advice on which buttons to press uh, because I, I think that that is quite an interesting factor I agree with uh, everything Anand said for example about models not being truth machines they're aids to thinking and we need to think about them in that kind of way so I was not surprised by the results that you got. And one of the reasons I'm not surprised is the way that we started with the demographic assumptions and the macroeconomic assumptions. And given the assumptions that went into the models, you could not have produced different results for all the other indicators. It was absolutely inevitable. So the first kind of piece of advice is to th these models have been driven by the so-called shared socioeconomic pathways and one of the observations to make is that more than 90 percent of the scenarios in the debate database uh, that we're currently looking at were based on shared socioeconomic pathway two which is middle of the road and you might have actually got more things if the community had troubled itself to do more work with the other scenarios, particularly SSP1 uh, on sustainable development. So I think that's the first button to press. When we run our scenarios workshop uh, for IPCC in April, one of the issues on the agenda will be are the current SSPs fit for purpose or do they need further development? And you will not get changes unless you play games with the, the, these uh, SSPs uh, the, the, 
the, the, the themselves. The other thing, the observation that was made about the heavy dependence on modelled in, uh, model intercomparison projects, which are usually built around a very specified assumption specified, usually by the funder of the of the project. Now, I am doing a talk on scenarios tomorrow, which I will in which I will be even more provocative, and make the point that three quarters of the models in the database were funded by the European Union. Uh, so is it, so, you know, so a certain set of questions were asked. Can I just say, I no longer hold an EU passport because I come from the UK, <laughs> but I can tell you I voted Remain enthusiastically. So, so this is also for the good of the EU, I think, as well as anything else. There should be a more inclusive approach to developing the kind of questions that modeling, model intercomparison projects actually address. So for me, that these would be the two buttons for you to press to take it forward. Think about the SSPs and try to get more inclusiveness in the way that questions address and projects. I don't think you know changing the models would make a lot of difference. If we didn't have IEMs, we'd have to invent them, and they'd end up pretty much the way they are at the moment. But, but they can be kicked prodded and directed in different ways, including by setting carbon budgets at a regional level, if, 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 if that's, that, that's what you wanted to do. I'll just make one other facetious remark, which I, I noted from the presentation. It's very kind of you to say that China should reach net zero before the UK. I don't know how you got these numbers, but it's actually in there. Uh, now, you know, I, it'd be really, uh, it would be very amiss if we did not invite our good friend, Meena Raman of the Third World Network, and uh, one of our most articulate voices for equity over uh, decades. Please, Meena. No, 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 no. No, you already have a time constraint at 6 o'clock. Uh, yeah, friends, I mean, this is absolutely frightening. I mean, I've, I've known this discussion from before about equity and the carbon budget and all that. But this idea of the scenarios and what the scenarios are actually showing and the fact that the pathways themselves are not the truth. Now, the entire negotiations are based on what the IPCC says. And everywhere you say best available science, best available science, best available science, you will have best available science and equity as if equity is different and best available science is different. Best available science is scientific and equity is not scientific. So what this, I am, I am absolutely appalled by the fact that all these assumptions are actually, you know, not challenged in, in the process itself. Because the process itself, if you look at the Glasgow Climate Pact, which is heralded as the the pact that took Paris forward, and, and if you look at everything which is there, in the, and, and every, even the globe, in the, in the structured expert dialogue, when we were all engaged, everything was IPCC, IPCC, every session, global stock take, every technical dialogue, IPCC. Now, my friends, if you are telling me that this is not the truth, because that's what the whole world believes, we have a serious, reset to do. And so I am very worried. Um, I don't know what to do. I really don't know what to do. Because we have been saying that this is unjust. We've been saying, for instance, this whole net zero, this whole net zero by 2050. It was yesterday, I mean, in, in, um, in Glasgow, it was said that, you know, we're keeping 1.5 degree alive and every country does net zero by 2050. And we've all, the, L, the, the civil society, all of us have condemned that because that's doing too little too late for the, for, the, for the developed world. We can't afford that. But yet, that is what has been locked in, as if that is the game in town. And so if everybody does net zero, we are all fine. And then you talk about the carbon sequestration and the, all that. I mean, this is, this is not the truth. This is a lie. And I think we need to call out this lie even more. Because it's, this is not science. Uh, we are very short of time. 
Uh, I am sure Tejal would, I certainly would, would like to make a minute uh, remarks in closure. But we can take uh, two quick questions from the audience. Uh, we have several experts. Well, sorry, we will run out of time on the room, but we can talk outside. But two quick questions, please. The first. Thank Hello, can you hear me? Yeah, thank you very much. Uh, my name is Alar Kurdej. I'm a senior scientist in working group 3 TSU. Um, just to follow on what Jim started, the idea of MIPS, Modern to Comparison Projects, and also, I very much agree with what Jim said. We, if we reinvent this, we probably end up with something similar. Um, um, louder, OK. Um, how do you see these MIPS starting? Where, what is the starting point of these MIPS? Does it originate from institutes in developing countries? Do developing countries lead on this research stream? And how can we kind of start this kind of collaboration so that capture these aspects where 75% of the current models are originating in Europe, and how can we force them in different direction? Sorry, I know, I know it's not an easy question, but I, th I think I, I very much agree that. No, no, we, yeah. we, we, it's a very obvious question, and we thought about it for a long time. So I, mean, I don't mean to be facetious. Uh, please, one more. Yes, Sebastian so, Richer from Save the Climate. Uh, just a question for everybody. Uh, in the models and so on, we evaluate the possibilities of gain, gaining access to the net zero. But we, as you said, uh, we are lacking uh, sometimes the clarity on the science capability, on the technological capabilities in the world. Do you think, particularly because for the 75% um, of the people who don't have access to these technologies and so on, do you see how we can improve the situation by transferring from rich country to poorer countries the, the knowledge on the technology so that they build themselves, not that they will build for them? Thank you. Thank you. I, uh, uh, the uh, question from, uh, I forget, uh, I, we, we'll, uh, I think uh, is a larger question. We are happy you raised it, but I don't think we really have the time to respond. So we will uh, invite you to discuss outside. So Tejal, you want to uh, wrap up in a minute? A minute for you, a minute for me. No, I think uh, a lot uh, uh, has be, uh, also been said. But I, I do want to also take off on what uh, Yuba said uh, about uh, the fact that these, are, these regions are diverse and there are unique solutions across re regions. Uh, but one of the things that the models, uh, you know, one of the uh, results that we wanted to focus on, that it is not really about renewable energy versus fossil fuels uh, in the models at all. It is energy that is con uh, that is limited, that is uh, constrained. So we are we are to develop with low levels of energy, even renewable energy. It's not just uh, fossil fuels. I mean, that at least one would have understood if it was only that. But it's not that. And this is, so if, if, if uh, Africa or Asia are at 10,000, it means certain regions within these uh, large regions are at even lower levels of income. So that, uh, that, that I think, is an important uh, thing to uh, notice. And I think you know, the, there has been sort of much said about where the models, uh, the, where the results actually origin, originate from, the problem with the models themselves, and how much can you kick them uh, and from which side to get different results uh, always remains a question. So should we be thinking about different modeling frameworks themselves? Should we be thinking about uh, look, looking at what is the desirable future and then talking about how we go about building it instead of starting with IAMs that have inbuilt structures that, will, that don't allow us to do this in the first place? Thank you. So I am not going to say very much. Uh, so I. First of all, it's my duty to thank our discussants, uh, especially Jim, who graciously uh, accepted to make remarks and point, uh, pointed several of these things. But uh, let me be frank about this. There are two points which are fundamental, which I think are problematic about the way the whole problem is thought of. And 
Tejal alluded to it in part. You think of science as being, uh, you know, you have science and then you have equity. As if equity cannot be thought of in objective terms and cannot be incorporated in the way you quantify a future world in uh, proper terms. So, you know, you can do it in a quantified way. And that was what for us the carbon budget was always about. That was why it is a starting point. That's point number one. The second point is in a complex problem like this, it must be our endeavor not to find the mean and median. But these are like valleys, you know, if uh, those who do modeling will understand. These are uh, valleys and terrains of solutions. So you must look for pathways within them. You must look for regions within them which are more equitable or less equitable, and that must be a key criteria. Unfortunately, we are left with this idea of deterministic uh, modeling. We are, and uh, the best we can do is to provide statistical distributions, which are not statistical distributions. And as a result, we end up where we are. I agree with Meena that this is, uh, there is a sense in which this is profoundly shocking. And this is, uh, I regret to say, Yuba, despite your uh, very clear uh, criticism, uh, that uh, it is not the IPCC that produces scenarios. But uh, there is, um, uh, you know, there be uh, people are talking about what is the AR7 scenarios going to be like. So there is a real issue. The IPCC sh cannot and should not become performative. Take your vetting criteria. You chopped off half the models which were sent to you. But then on the other hand, you, you could have created a classification system which was based around the, all the models that you got or not just a subset of the models because you had some other criteria by which you thought they should be assessed. So I think there are a number of issues. And uh, I, <laughs> I really, once again, uh, uh, underline uh, the three points we made. I'm not going to repeat myself. This is a matter of profound concern for uh, uh, the negotiations. And uh, at this moment, when we ourselves looked at the results, the sense of being a little appalled, which you had, was one we shared. So we hope that we can go forward from here. And uh, I hope there will be others who will engage with us on meeting this challenge. Thank you very much.